uh, people are getting used to the jet lag and now they're coming later and later in the day. Uh, <laughs> uh, on the first day, everyone was really, really early and, you know, hungry earlier, but now, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so welcome to Berkeley, I guess. Um, okay, so uh, welcome to the fourth day and uh, today Dan is going to tell us more about the power of uh, algebra and semi rings. Um, please take it away. Okay, thanks, Hank. Uh, so we saw during the first uh, day, uh, Hank, um, when he presented his talk, he showed us the, the power and the, the um, utility of extending um, relational queries to uh, real numbers. And yesterday we saw uh, from Val uh, how uh, you can get much more um, mileage out of extending not to real numbers, but extending these relational queries to arbitrary semi-rings. Uh, but real applications, uh, um, um, they... Um, data science, they require iteration. Uh, lots of problems they require the combination of, of uh, queries and iterations. Think about reachability in graphs, uh, clustering, gradient descent, and so, and so on. So we need uh, some language, some technique, some concepts that allow us to combine uh, queries over uh, semi-rings uh, with iteration. Now in databases, we have this beautiful language called data log. It has been studied since the early uh, in the 80s. Uh, that uh, has beautiful theoretical properties, very attractive ones, uh, but uh, it is defined only over uh, monotone functions over sets. This is all it does. So um, people have studied extensions of data logs to uh, um, negation and to aggregate. Um, but today I want to show you the, a, a particular way of thinking about extending data log. Uh, by using semi-rings, by extending, extending it to semi-rings. It's an algebraic approach to extending data log. Yeah, this is, this is the agenda. So there will be two lectures. Uh, the first lecture is going to be very basic, so it's going to be a little bit boring. Um, it's going, I'm going to give a quick background on data log uh, for the extremely few among you who are not more experts in data, in data log than I am. Um, and I'm going to describe then some basic techniques from partial orders and uh, from semi-rings that we use to reason about termination of extensions of data log to, uh, to semi-rings. <coughs> and the second lecture will be a little bit more technical. I'm going to talk about polynomial equations and how to reason in general about termination. And hopefully I, I have some time at the end to talk about uh, two beautiful concepts, uh, pretty old ones, uh, closed semi-rings and clean algebras. The main takeaway from both lectures is that you can use algebraic properties of the semi-ring in order to reason about algorithmic properties of the extension of data log to semi-rings. And I find this beautiful, the fact that you can use um, um, algebraic identities and what you know about your semi-ring to quickly infer something about the behavior of your data log programs. Okay, so I hope you all were here at uh, Wald's talk yesterday. Um, uh, just, to, just to set the expectations right, uh, he sets the bar very high, uh, so I simply gave up. So uh, you take what you get. Uh, I'm going to do my best to tell you about his techniques. They are beautiful, um, but I am not planning to match Paul's talk. Uh, good. So let's talk, uh, start about talking about the data log. Um, and I apologize to people in the room who know a lot more uh, about data logs than I know. How many people nev have never seen data log? Okay, good, so good. So I, uh, this is my excuse. Um, so here is my quick introduction to data log in three slides. I'm going to start with an example. Uh, the example is the following. We are given an input graph. Come on, here's my pointer, where's my pointer, here. Uh, so we are given an input graph described as a binary relation. Uh, and there is one particular node and we want to compute the set of all the nodes reachable from A. And if you can see this graph, which is not very visible, these uh, nodes are uh, B, C, and D. Uh, H is not reachable, and neither are uh, the other ones. Uh, I often give this talk uh, to an audience that has many SQL uh, practitioners, and I need to, um, uh, to acknowledge that this is something you can write in SQL, uh, but I don't recommend it. There are many problems with it. Instead, I recommend using data log. A data log is a very simple um, language. It consists of rules, uh, and the rules can be recursive, and you read them from uh, right to left. 
they are exactly the same notation as we saw in the first day in Hang's talk and uh, that we saw yesterday in, in Val's talk on, uh, on conjunctive queries. Uh, here we have three rules. Uh, the first two, they compute the transitive closure of the relation E. And the last rule computes a unary set port answer. So how do we compute the transitive closure? Well, every uh, pair of nodes x, y in the uh, edge relation is also in the transitive closure. And if we have a, a, a pair xc and a pair zy uh, in the transitive closure and in the edge relation, then xy is in the transitive closure. And finally, um, uh, uh, every uh, node y connected to a in the transitive closure should be in our answer. That is uh, data log. Uh, the order of the rules uh, does not matter. You can interleave the rules in any order you want. Uh, and in terms of terminology, uh, the input relations, the black ones in my, um, in my slides, are the uh, called extensional database predicates, or EDBs. And the output relations will be blue. They are called intentional database predicates. OK, so this is data log, um, and, uh, by example. Now, uh, the. The beauty of the data log is it has a very elegant semantics. Uh, and uh, in order to define the semantics, I need to define a simple concept called the immediate consequence operator. The immediate consequence operator is a function uh, that takes as input a state of the IDBs. Think of it like a partial computation that we have done. And computes a new state of uh, the IDBs of those relations we are computing. So in our toy example, uh, we consolidate the first two rules into a single into a single rule, and the um, an immediate consequence operator takes uh, some partial computation of the transitive closure and computes uh, a new state of the partial computation of the transitive closure, and does the same thing for the answer set. So in the, in the literature, there are three different semantics for data log a model theoretic semantics, fixed point semantics, a, and a proof theoretic semantics, and they're all equivalent. I'm going to uh, glance over them extremely quickly, quickly, making some people here angry. Um, the minimal model semantics uh, is defined in a much more elegant way, but algebraically is equivalent to saying that we are looking for that state of the IDBs, for which if we apply the immediate consequence operator, we get a subset of that state of IDBs. And the fixed, least fixed point semantics says that we, we want to get equality. And there is a third semantic that I'm glossing over. Okay. Yes. Why is the first one subset and the second one equality? Least fixed point is equality, but why is the model semantics subset? Yeah, so in the model semantics, I was, um, um, yeah, so I, I didn't include this. In the, the model theoretic semantics, what you do, you co convert each rule into an implication. So um, you, you keep your T, the, the same T as here, and the turn style becomes an implication. Uh, and then the, the uh, um, model is any state of the IDBs for which all the implications defined by the data log rules uh, hold. And you're looking for the minimal one. And implication means subset. It doesn't mean implication in the opposite direction. And that would be clear when you say this. Point semantics the equation just gives you fixed point on the smaller sense. Uh, and exactly, so we want this, and we, uh, we, we don't want any fixed point, we don't want any model, we want the, this, the least one, the smallest one. Yes? So, is it like, a, it, it satisfies some, some kind of one after this thing so that you have this inclusion? It's popular. Is that such a Exactly. So then the question was, is that some kind of monotonicity? Uh, and the answer is yes. The way we are going to compute it, we are going to increase this, this partial state. And if there are no more questions here, then I can show this right on the next slide because it's a, a fundamental concept in data log. This is how we compute the output of a data log program with, uh, with, with something what, that we call the naive algorithm. We start with the, the um, uh, empty state for all the IDBs. And then we repeatedly apply the immediate consequence operator, computing a larger and larger state uh, until uh, it stabilizes, until we reach a fixed point. Okay, so to give you an example in our uh, uh, toy example with the transitive closure and the set of reachable nodes, 
uh, we will start from the empty set for both the alternative closure and answer. <clears throat> and then we repeatedly apply the immediate consequence operator, getting larger and larger uh, sets. OK, an important observation here. This naive algorithm always terminates. And moreover, it terminates in a number of steps that is no more than the number of ground atoms uh, that you can construct uh, using, a, using the IDB predicates and using the constants that are given in the input database, in the uh, uh, input EDB predicates. So what this means in this example uh, is that you look at the input relation E, which defines a graph. And let's suppose we have uh, little n nodes in that graph. So we can have at most n squared uh, possible uh, tuples in the uh, relation T, and at most uh, n tuples in, in, in answer. So the total number of tuples that we can add is at most n squared plus 1, which is little, k, little n squared. And I like to ignore that little n. I like to call big n the total number of such tuples that we can ever produce. And this is an upper bound of the number of iterations. OK. Uh, is data log clear? Yes. And you cannot delete entries. Data log is restricted to having only monotone rules. Uh, so if there are no more uh, questions, then it's quiz time. What do these data log rules compute? They look pretty much like relative closure, uh, but uh, here we have two occurrences of the relation E, and similarly here two occurrences of the relation E. While here on the on the left on the left right, um, the, the the variables are slightly different. So uh, x e versus z x. What do they compute? <laughs> Pass of even lengths, perfect. And the other one? Uh, no, data, data log experts are not allowed to. Uh, this is the same generation. Very subtle. Uh, so here, it clearly, uh, we are computing pass of, of even lengths. We start with a pass of length 2, and then uh, we extend pass with one node, um, uh, what I should the left, one to the right. This is more interesting. So here we start from a node uh, Z, and both, um, any two children of Z are uh, in, in T. And moreover, if um, UV has the same, uh, have a common, uh, how does it work? If UV are in the same generation, then their children X and Y are also in the same generation. Are you assuming undirected graphs? I'm assuming directed graphs. I hope I got it right. Because, I mean, the first I'm pretty sure I got it right. Got two edges coming out of Z, so. You're looking at the left? The right, on the right. The right. You got two edges coming out of Z. Yeah. So um, um, uh, think about uh, going from left to right. This is uh, parent to child. Yeah. So uh, X and, and Y have a common parent, Z. And here we are saying that if U, V were already in the same generation, then their children, X and Y, are also in the same generation. But how does that form a path in the direction of the end? <coughs> so, uh, so, uh, how do we define uh, uh, some generation in words? Uh, think about an, a, a node uh, and look at two nodes, x and y. If there is the same distance from that common ancestor, then we say that x and y are in the same generation. This makes sense in a tree, but in a graph with uh, cycles, the intuition is a bit uh, more it makes sense in trees, and then graph with cycles, and these intuition is a little bit lost. Good. But uh, the, the, the message is, data log is a cool language. You can express interesting things. Uh, on the other hand, it's also very limited. Uh, data log does not allow us to express negation, uh, because it insists on this elegant semantics, uh, the least fixed point and the, the minimal model, and it does not have aggregates. It's a second. It's a second bullet that is a uh, uh, that is a focus of, of this talk. We really want to to um, allow aggregates in data log, and um, this um, extensions of data log with aggregates have, has been studied since uh, since the mid uh, early 90s, and usually people have examples like the bill of material. 
So here is an example where we would need uh, aggregates. Uh, we have a set of parts called X, and for each part, there is a cost C. This is a native cost of that part C. In addition, there is a subpart relation. Every uh, part X uh, might have a subpart Y. It might have multiple subparts Y. And the, the goal of this program is to compute for every part X the total cost. And the total cost is, it, is its own cost C plus the, the total cost of all its subpart and sub subparts, which I called with total subpart. So how is total subpart? Well, here we need to uh, sum up the total cost of the direct subparts of X. What is important here is this interleaving between recursion. So total depends on total subpart, which in terms, uh, in terms uh, depends on total. The interleaving of recursion and aggregation. This makes uh, the semantics more difficult, and uh, it breaks the standard semantics of data log. Okay. Uh, there is a second example that you find in the literature called uh, the company control example. Uh, I thought it's a very clever one, but it's not too clever. So talk to me after the break, and I can, I can explain you what goes on. But the same thing happens here. There is an interleaving between summation, um, <coughs> um, recursion, and also a, a, a threshold condition. So it is slightly, it's slightly more complicated. Good. So this is a, the, the topic of this, this talk. So, um, Did you talk about the semantics? Uh, no, I'm going to define a, a new approach to defining these, uh, these semantics <coughs> that is based on uh, or, uh, ordered semantics. And then, yes, and then we will talk about semantics. Okay, so um, I, I just want to acknowledge the extremely rich literature uh, uh, devoted in the 90s and beyond to defining and extending data log to negation. Uh, so there are some really beautiful papers um, that uh, proposed and, and studied stable model semantics, well-founded semantics, bilattices. Uh, uh, that entire literature is really beautiful. Uh, the, uh, the work in the early 90s that aimed to extend data log with aggregates sometimes borrowed similar concepts. For example, you can find um, uh, the semantics of uh, uh, <coughs> min-max aggregations based on stable model semantics. But this is not the path I'm, I'm planning to, to discuss today. But instead, I want to use semirings. I want to uh, extend data log to... Um, uh, to operate over semi-rings. So this is in the spirit of Val's talk yesterday. <coughs> uh, uh, but there is a little twist. <coughs> uh, not technically, but in terms of, um, uh, of, of, um, of goal. So in Val's talk, the, the semi-rings were annotations uh, designed to explain how a computation has proceeded. They were really provenance annotations. I'm going to make those annotations first-class citizens. Those are the values that we want to compute. Same computation, but really now they are uh, our output. So the um, bill of material example, I want to write something like this. Uh, we have a single relation cost, uh, a unit relation cost that contains only the parts, but its value now is that semi-ring annotation. It's the actual cost of the part X. And uh, the, the um, recursive program that computes the total cost is written very naturally. Uh, it is, is, is <clears throat> some product expression like you saw in Hung's talk on Monday. It is a cost uh, plus the, the sum over all the subparts of the total cost of that subpart where total is defined recursively. This is how I would like to define um, uh, a data log. So to do this extension, <coughs> we need to extend the notion of a semi-ring to be partially ordered. So that is the topic of the next part. Let's talk about partial orders. Uh, and then we will, uh, we will show how to extend data log to, to partially order semi-rings. Yes, Albert. Uh, typically, it's quite clear that this plus should be sum. Uh, yeah. What is this times? Um, well, <coughs> in this example, think about times as being times. Um, multiplication. 
which means that if uh, y is indeed a subpart, then this is one. And if y is not a subpart, then this is zero. Ah. And therefore, you, you sum the right thing. Okay, select. But you touch on a very, um, on a very uh, sensitive topic, and I'm going to come back to this. Uh, Okay, so let's talk about partially ordered sets. And this is where I need to apologize because this is very basic, but I want to uh, make sure that we are all on the same, um, on the same, um, uh, the same speed. Partial orders, uh, a um, set P uh, is called a partially ordered set. It's a really a binary relation, uh, which is reflective, anti-symmetric and transitive. This is a partial order. We will always assume that P has a minimal element, which is bottom. Uh, and when there exists, I'm going to denote the least upper bound and greatest lower bound with these, uh, these symbols. And notice that bottom is actually the, um, the, it is the greatest lower bound of the entire set or the least upper bound of the empty set. Okay, very basic. And of course, a monotone function is a function between two post sets uh, that preserves the, the order relation. Okay, good. So um, a simple examples, the standard examples like natural numbers, real numbers, the booleans are uh, nicely ordered. Here is an interesting one. Remember the, the, um, the tropical semi-ring. In the tropical semi-ring that Val showed you, there was a natural order, which is actually the reverse order. So I'm going to add infinity because that's part of the tropical semi-ring. And imagine ordering this set in the opposite order. The smallest element, is infinity, and when you grow, you grow from infinity down to zero. It's kind of uh, uh, makes your, your head spin. Um, the the this, um, family of subsets, the set of subsets is partially ordered. Um, here is an important example, uh, uh, again from Val's talk. Consider all the uh, polynomials with, um, you know, in this case, over a single variable with integer coefficients. We can partially order them by saying that one polynomial is less than the other. If every coefficient of every, um, uh, of every monomial is less than the coefficient of the similar monomial and the other polynomial. Now, an important concept that is it's very um, um, useful to, to, <clears throat> to apply when it applies is that you can, sometimes can lift properties from a single set to products. So in the case of, of um, partial orders, we can always organize the Cartesian product of two partial orders by ordering the, the doubles pairwise. And similarly, we can take an, any power of a partial order and uh, order it pairwise. Yeah, so watch for this construction because uh, it is relevant if you think about the, um, uh, the, the uh, naive evaluation algorithm of data log, that needs to operate over multiple IDB predicates. That tuple of IDB predicates lives in a Cartesian product of partial, of partial orders. So we will always come back to these uh, products. Yeah, uh, it's, it's like here. So it means, um, uh, formally it means a set of functions from omega to P. Intuitively, you can think of it as a, as a set of tuples, uh, where the elements in the tuples are elements from P. And the number of elements in the tuple is this omega. Each position in that tuple is, is one element of omega. Uh, but a quick way to think about this is, think about omega as being a number, and this is just P to that number. Good. Let's talk about fixed points, <clears throat> and least fixed points. So now we fix a monotone function from a, a partially ordered set to, to itself, and we call x a fixed point if f of x is x. Standard fixed point. We call it a prefix point. This is a not, not, not such a well-known concept. We call it a prefix point if x uh, of x is below x. Obviously, every fixed point is a prefix point, but not vice versa. And we are uh, usually interested in the least, uh, the least fixed point uh, or the least prefix point. And then we call it the least fixed point or the least prefix, prefix point. Simple concept. Uh, we are going to, what am I doing here? Okay, so yeah, so these are, these should be clear concepts. Good, so the, uh, 
Um, a little known simple fact is that if you, uh, if you happen to have a least prefix point, a least one, a least prefix point, then that is also a least fixed point. So as you're trying to prove that your function has a least fixed point, uh, it's often convenient to prove that it has a least prefix point, and that is also a least fixed point. Try to prove it as an exercise. Yes, Remy. Is this under something that F is monotone? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, we, uh, I, I, I should have said that we, we always assume that F is monotone. Otherwise, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Actually, it does make sense, but uh, we, we are going to assume that F is monotone. Interestingly, the converse doesn't hold. Uh, you can have examples where there is a least fixed point, uh, and of course, that's also a prefix point, but it's not the least one, and there is no least prefix point. Makes your head spin. Uh, but uh, remember that you can only use this in one direction, from here to here. Uh, you can connect this to data log. Remember, we had two semantics. The minimal model semantics is the least prefix point, and the least fixed point is the least fixed point. And um, uh, the, the fact that they are, they are equivalent is just an instance of this little theorem. Yes, Paris. Uh, uh, this C is actually a posit or an element of the posit? It's an element of the posit. It's, uh, it's one of these. Because in the in the data log when you define then this A is not an element, right? It's a whole set. Uh, yes. This requires a little bit of uh, requires a little bit of care. When we talk about data log, uh, F this F will be the immediate consequence operator. And uh, P is the order set of all the uh, possible instances of the IDB predicates. So uh, when we look for a fixed point, we look for an instance of the IDB uh, predicates that are such that if we apply the immediate consequence operator, we get the same, the same result. Yes? Does it say anything about the uniqueness of the fixed point or prefix point? OK. Uh, so quick poll, uh, is a least, uh, is it the least fixed point? Is the least fixed point unique? Of course it's unique, because uh, the least fixed point must be below every other fixed point. If you have a second one that you think is also least, well, then you also have the opposite uh, inequality. And since um, the partial order is um, anti-reflect, uh, um, anti-symmetric, anti that means that the two least fixed points must be the same. Okay, so let me see how am I doing on time. Um, I was wondering whether I should show the proof of this, uh, but I shouldn't. I think uh, uh, I really invite you to, to prove this. It's a, it's a one-liner, two-liner, uh, and uh, it's really instructive. Proof that if Z is a, the least prefix point, then uh, it is also a fixed point, and moreover, it is the least fixed point. Good. Ask me in the break uh, how to how to prove it. Good. So um, how do we how did we compute the least uh, fixed point for data log? We used the naive algorithm, the naive evaluation algorithm, and that extends to any partially ordered set. That extends to computing the the um, fixed point or the least least fixed point or the least prefix point of every monotone function on a partially ordered set. And the, I, um, the, um, it, it consists of defining this sequence. We start from the empty set, from the, sorry, we start from bottom, and then we repeatedly apply the function f, obtaining a, an increasing sequence of elements in the set P. And this, I've seen uh, the name, um, the term cleaning sequence uh, for this sequence, especially in papers by Esparza. And I like the name. So let's call this. But it's much older than that, right? Much, much older. This is the Kanaster Tarski theorem from the late 30s independent. Right. But, no, but the term cleaning sequence. But that's how, OK, the term. But, but the, the proof is Kanaster and Tarski from the late 30s independent. 
Right. So the, the, the proof actually uses this little yeah. uh, this little part. Okay. So uh, I'm going to call this a clean sequence. Uh, it depends on the uh, um, poset and the function f. Um, a, an important fact: if you're looking for a fixed point, uh, for any fixed point, not just the least one, uh, remains with always above every element of the clean sequence. So by completing the cleaning sequence, you can never go wrong. You can never exceed a, a, a fixed one, not the least one, not any other fixed one. OK, so this, this is a good. Uh, um, but uh, now you will ask me, is, uh, is the least upper bound of the cleaning, se uh, of the cleaning sequence the least fixed point? And the answer is yes, but we do need some additional assumptions. And they are standard in the literature, uh, what people do they require the, the forceps to be omega continuous. So let's define this. Uh, an omega chain <coughs> is a sequence of increasing elements in the poset. The clean sequence is an omega chain. Okay. Uh, so the, the partial order is called omega complete. If for every omega chain, the, uh, the uh, least upper bound exists and the function is called omega continuous if it commutes with um, the least upper bound of any omega chain. And in that case, it's not hard to see that the, uh, the least, the cleaning sequence, the least upper bound of a cleaning sequence exists and it is a least fixed point. Uh, it's important to look at some examples here. So um, uh, the, the set of natural numbers uh, with a standard order is not omega complete because you can grow and grow and grow and never reach, uh, there is no least upper bound. But if we add infinity, they're in, we're in good shape. Then it, it becomes an omega complete set. Uh, interestingly, remember the tropical semi-ring, which has a reverse order? This is omega complete because you can never, you can never decrease uh, uh, for too long. Yeah? You can only decrease a finite amount of time. Um, here are non-examples, of course, just the natural numbers is not omega complete. The set of polynomials, uh, very important for, for our discussion soon, it is not omega complete. Uh, and even if you extend the coefficients uh, to include infinity, this set is still not omega complete. So how can we make it omega complete? Any guesses? Then why? Is Nx is not omega complete? Uh, why, why is what? Oh, so because A is already not omega complete. Yeah. yeah, good observation. So why why is this not omega complete, as Udipa pointed out? Because this is not omega complete. So if you just take constant here, you can grow and grow those constants forever. OK, so I'm fixing this by saying that let's allow the coefficients of the monomials to include infinity. And this is still, still not omega complete. What do we need to do? Add the excluding series. Uh, add a power series. So uh, not excluding infinity because um, the powers of x do not necessarily grow. But I make it a power series. OK, so this will, will come into, uh, into play later. Uh, OK, so just to summarize why we care about these omega complete sets is because then um, the, uh, the omega continu continuous function, they have a least fixed point, and that is exactly the least upper bound of the cleaning sequence. Yes, Bob. And I'm sorry for intervening in this manner, but I'd like to share with, you know, what well, is uh, Continuity is, there's no accident, that, if you can tell me if I'm saying stupid things, please. Uh, there's no accident that continuity of this kind uh, actually arises uh, in conjunction with cleaning state, because uh, he was proving fixed point theorems for computational, yes, for recursion theory and computational phenomena. And uh, similarly, this comes up a lot in the semantics of programming languages in the work of Payne, Scott, and many others. So, so there is something about continuity that is of special interest to computer scientists because of the computational nature. Uh, mathematicians who do very abstract work they probably, you know, do not care, you know, <laughs> ultra filters and what have you. They may not care that much about omega continuity. But for us, computer science is very important. Ron? Oh, I, I don't disagree. I mean, I'm just pointing out that this fact was not to 
uh, Canaster and Dutarsky independently late 30s, Klinik got his PhD in 1941. But their proof was different. No, that was the proof. So, the Knaster, no, Tarski, Knaster, Tarski, 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 in a complete lattice and he took the in of the set of all prefix points. The, there is no in a complete no lattice, you have both subs and ifs. And if you take the in, you can show that that is uh, this prefix point and the yeah. Yes, okay. Nasser, I think Nasser Tarski, if I remember correctly, so takes a complete lattice and, uh, and proves that um, the, the set of, of fixed point is actually itself a complete lattice. Yes. And yes. the reason is because you, you intersect the, the set of least prefix points, uh, which is a complete lattice with a set of greatest, with, with of least, of, sorry, you intersect the, the prefix points, which is a complete lattice with the postfix points, which is also a complete lattice. The intersection of two complete lattice is a complete lattice, and that is a, that happens to be the fixed point. Uh, interestingly, that actually we don't care about that uh, because all the examples that I'm aware of they are omega continuous. So I can't talk about delta continuity or about uh, L continuity. All these beautiful concepts um, from from algebra because there is no need. Omega continue. Uh, everything I've seen is omega continuous. You can construct artificial examples which are not. Yes, Loris. So, so can you always complete the two sets to an only a complete one? Ah, cool question, because this is why you need to come to the second lecture. <laughs> okay, I will show you how to do it. It's actually trivial. Uh, not, not one element. Uh, think about, yeah, think about n times n. Okay. Uh, so why why do we spend time on this slide? Well, because of this, because uh, then we have um, uh, ev every um, continuous function has a least fixed point and we are done. Here is where we diverge from the classical work. I want the uh, naive algorithm to terminate in a finite number of steps. I don't want to compute this, this increasing sequence forever. This is, we, we don't want to do this. We want the algorithm to actually terminate. Uh, so when does this happen? When is a clean sequence finite? Because uh, if it's finite, then the least fixed point of F is uh, one of the terms of the clean sequence. So when it is, and when is it finite? And again, a beautiful concept that you find in many papers in the literature is that of uh, the ascending chain condition. So uh, we say that a poset satisfies the ans ascending chain condition if for every omega chain, if every omega chain is finite. So for every omega chain, there exists an, an index such that from there uh, um, on, all the elements are equal. Okay, so examples. Uh, you remember the tropical semi-ring? As infinite as it, as it looks, it actually has the AC, it satisfies the ACC condition. You start from infinity, but you cannot go down for too long. You need to stop. Yep. Very interesting. Uh, in the opposite, in the normal direction, you can grow infinitely many times, so you don't satisfy the ACC condition. And here is a catch. If we define the tropical semi-ring over the reals, uh, then uh, uh, this does not satisfy the ACC condition. You can decrease forever. Yeah, so it's a subtle, subtle notion. Uh, good. What about the products? So if, uh, if we have two post sets that satisfy the ascending chain condition, then so does their product, it requires a little bit of proof, and uh, so does a power, a finite power of that um, <coughs> post set, but not an infinite power. So we have to be careful. Okay, good. So um, again, how do, why do we care about this? We care about this because in that case, the least fixed point of, uh, of any function or any monotone function doesn't have to be continuous or anything. Uh, if, if, we, if the ACC condition is satisfied, then the least fixed point is one of these terms of the Gleaney sequence, and we are in good shape. Yes, Paris. So this condition uh, implies that you're also omega complete and omega continuous. Yeah. I um, removed that from this slide because it's too much, but yeah. It implies that it has said this omega complete and it implies that every monotone function is omega continuous. Thank you. Good. How do we check ACC? How, how do we look at it when we have a, a simple sufficient condition to check the uh, ACC condition? And the answer is yes. 
uh, there is this nice notion that people also use often in the literature called the rank of a poset. And I, I'm using the definition from a beautiful book on uh, enumerative combinatorics by Stanley. I strongly recommend this book. Um, and uh, he defines the, the rank of a strictly increasing chain to be uh, the index of the last element of the chain, uh, where you have to start by um, numbering them from zero. Okay, this is the rank of a strictly increasing sequence. And the rank of a post set of a partially ordered set is the largest rank of any strictly increasing sequence. Yes, Carl. <laughs> okay, this is interesting. Better? Yeah. Okay, is the is rank clear? Okay, quiz time. What is the rank of the set of booleans? What is the longest sequence you can construct? Uh, uh, no, we call it one. Because we start from zero and uh, this is one. It's actually, it matters. This is why I cite silently here. So, so don't, uh, don't ask me why did I start enumerating from zero. Because you have to start from zero, otherwise it does, it's not nice. We want it to be nice. What's the rank of um, a, a, a power set? Size of omega. Size of omega, very nice. What is the rank uh, of our uh, uh, nice um, um, tropical semi-ring where you cannot, you cannot grow forever? This is infinity. All the sequences are finite, but you can construct them bigger and bigger. Interestingly, um, so finite rank obviously implies ECC, but not vice versa. What about the products? We care about a, a lot about the products. Uh, well, the rank of a product is the sum of the ranks. This is where it really matters that you start from zero to get these nice expressions. And similarly, the rank of a power is the size of that set times the rank of P. And obviously, if uh, the rank of a partially ordered set is R, then the least uh, uh, fixed point of, of F is um, um, the, the cleaning sequence at step R or even earlier. Good. So this was my um, uh, tutorial on very basic uh, um, um, facts from um, about uh, partially ordered sets. So let's just summarize. Uh, one thing too is that it's worth remembering is that if you're looking for the, for the least fixed point, it suffices to look for the least prefix point. And sometimes it's easier to prove that you have a least pre, uh, prefix point. Uh, uh, omega completeness and omega continuity, uh, which always happens in, in our world of database um, applications, that implies that the least fixed point of, uh, of, a, of a function is the uh, least upper bound of the clean sequence. And finally, if you're lucky and your set has a finite rank, uh, that implies the ACC condition. Uh, if you just have the ACC condition, that is enough to imply that the cleaning sequence is finite. And, um, um, and, and therefore, the, you can compute the least fixed point in a finite number of steps. Good. Any questions so far about, about partially ordered sets? Yes, Rory. In the sense that it gets closer and closer to something. Uh, so uh, obviously, if you if you if you take the least upper bound, then this convergence happens. But I'm not aware of how to exploit this in a in a practical setting. Although I have uh, some things to say towards the end of the last, of the next lecture, some uh, beautiful concepts. Good. Good. So now we are finally ready to extend data log uh, uh, to from from uh, sets to semi rings. So what do we need for this? Uh, we already know uh, from the lectures by Hung and by Val how to extend conjunctive queries or even unions of conjunctive queries to semi-rings. This is what Val did for, for provenance. This is what Hung did with real numbers. So we know how to interpret those conjunctive queries over, um, over semi-rings. Uh, so data log is of course defined over sets. So we want to also define it over semi-rings but it requires a partial order. We require that partial order in order to compute the, the fixed point in order to guarantee that it exists 
or in order to check if uh, the naive algorithm terminates in a finite number of steps. So for that, we need to ensure that the same ring we are, uh, we are defining data log over is also ordered. And uh, I'm going to do this in the simplest possible way. Uh, but before I uh, show you the definition, I need to explain to you what a pre-semi-ring is. We know what a semi-ring is, what is a pre-semi-ring, and I put it here on the bottom. So a pre-semi-ring does not require that x times 0 is equal to 0. Yep, you just drop that condition. Actually, in the literature, you sometimes find uh, people defining a semi-ring without this condition, and they don't call it a pre-semi-ring. But the correct terminology uh, today seems to be that we call this a pre-semi-ring if we don't insist on that condition. And I don't want to insist on it because some, some concrete examples of, of um, applications, they are actually pre-semi-rings or not semi-rings. Yes, Paris. Is this valid? Is this important? So why, when we talk about provenance, we want to have this, and now when we talk about data log, we don't want to have this? Um, it's just a, um, uh, it, 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 it allows you some, some semi-rings uh, that I care about uh, for, for a data log application that were not interesting for provenance applications. That, that's all there is. So, so which semi-ring? Because which? if you want to maintain this conceit that zero is the label of an absent tuple, mm -hmm. then, then this would mean that you take the, uh, you know, a join of a tuple with an absent tuple, yeah? The result is an absent tuple. So, so, would, uh, so if you didn't have that, would some uh, relation algebra optimization so break or like what would break? Less provenance, but you know, as always, you can patch things. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, we, we can have a more uh, um, interesting discussion once we see some examples. I think there was another question here. The, the, yeah. I was asking which semiring, uh, uh, which pre semiring is not a semiring that you are interested in. Yeah, I, I have one example in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, but first, let, let me uh, show you how we extend a uh, semiring or a pre semiring to a, a partial order uh, in the most brutal way. Uh, I'm just going to say that this structure is a partially ordered pre semiring or a POPS uh, if it consists of a uh, pre semiring and a partial order with a bottom such that addition and multiplication are monotone. <laughs> and, and this is a condition there I might I, um, question whether we need it or I, I, I need it for the next slide, but you can also uh, uh, contemplate uh, dropping this condition. So I'm going to insist that bottom times x is bottom. So this will satisfy val to some extent. If you don't want a tuple, you just annotate it with bottom, you don't annotate it with zero. And when zero equals bottom, completely happy. <laughs> and when the zero, which will happen in most cases, then, uh, then we are completely happy. Okay, so two simple properties. The first one is trivial. It's a trivial exercise. In any uh, pops, bottom plus bottom is bottom. The second one is really important. And it actually simplifies the discussion, makes you wonder why do we even talk about pops. Um, take any partially ordered pre semiring define it, its core to be the set of all elements of the form x plus bottom. Uh, we can organize this as a, um, a pre-semi-ring using the, the inherited operations plus and multiplication. Uh, the, the identity is going to be 0 plus bottom. The identity for multiplication is 1 plus bottom. It turns out that this set is always a semi-ring. So it will satisfy this identity. And moreover, it is a naturally ordered semi-ring. That is a cool exercise. Yes, Val? Is the plus that you use there in x plus bottom a formal adjoinment, or is it actually the plus in the semi-ring? That is, it gives you another element in P. It, 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 it gives you another, another element in P. It, this is a subset of, of, of P. Yeah. OK? So uh, proving that it's part nat naturally order requires a little bit of thinking with, with a one-liner um, interesting exercise. Good. So uh, what was a naturally ordered semi-ring? Excuse me, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Before that, bottom, oh, no, bottom time, sorry, take it back. That's clear. So, so, so just to, 
Okay. <laughs> uh, I want this one later. Point. Yes, Pierre. Yeah, I mean, your pop system is very commutative. Oh, I forgot to mention this. All the same earrings that I'm considering are commutative. Okay, good. So, what was a naturally ordered semi ring? Uh, you cannot actually, people sometimes define a natural order even on a pre semi ring. Uh, remember that in any semi ring or pre semi ring, you can define this relation, x is less than y, if there exists a z such that x plus z is equal to y. This is always transitive, it's always reflexive. Uh, but it's not necessarily anti symmetric. When it is, then uh, we, we call it a, a, the natural order, and in that case, we say that S is naturally ordered. When S is naturally ordered, when it is a, a semi-ring and it is naturally ordered, then, of course, it's also a POPs, because you just take that natural order and define it as your, as your order. And the core, <laughs> the core is itself, because zero is just bottom. So finally, I get to Pierre's example, here is an example which I think is very, very useful for, for numerical applications. Uh, it takes a set of real numbers and uh, extends them with bottom. The set of real numbers, I should remind you, is not a naturally ordered semi-ring. The natural order is not, is not connected to the semi-ring in an in interesting way. Uh, when you compute a fixed point, you don't want to start from minus infinity from the smallest element. Uh, so the order in the areas doesn't help us. Instead, what you can do, you can add, uh, you can add an artificial an artificial element bottom. This is what people do in, in denotational semantics. Uh, add a, a, an artificial element bottom and simply extend the operations plus and times uh, to bottom to be such that bottom plus x is bottom, bottom times x is bottom. So everything uh, bottom is less than everything. Nothing else is comparable. Here, the core is trivial. Uh, the core is just the element bottom, because uh, whatever you're adding to bottom, you're getting bottom. Okay, so I hope this explains why uh, I, I really care about um, about capturing this example. And there is another one called the four uh, the four lattice, which is also um, a useful example of of a pre semiring Yes, fine. I believe that when you show me what you do with the negative real numbers. Ah, okay, I can show you. Uh, and Camilo? What's the order on this? Uh... Yeah, so the order is uh, bottom is below everything, nothing else is comparable. Think of about bottom as being undefined, everything else is defined, and uh, once it's defined, there is no, compa no more comparison. Good. So finally, we can extend data log to semi rings. And when we extend it, I'm going to put a, a ring here at the top. And then we are going to call it data logo because it's over a semi ring. So um, this is a pretty disappointing slide because it's very simple. What we are going to do, we are going to replace the standard relations over sets uh, with P relations where P is our chosen partially ordered pre semi ring. So the, the, re the relations now then associate to each tuple an element from this partially ordered uh, uh, pre semiring The operators that we use in data logs, they become the operators, they're going to replace with the operators in the semiring. So for example, we had a data log rule like this, and now this becomes a data log rule like that, where the operators uh, are now operators from a semiring, and the relations, they are P relations. Yes, is that a finite sum? And is this a finite sum? That's a very good. Uh, 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 it, right. Uh, it, uh, I'll come back to this. <laughs> uh, and uh, the rest follows naturally. The semantics will be uh, the least fixed point of the immediate consequence operator. If this can be defined using, an, uh, it can be computed using the naive evaluation algorithm. If it terminates, not clear anymore. Uh, and uh, the naive algorithm defines a, a cleaning sequence, um, this increasing sequence that hopefully will terminate, and we will uh, discuss when it terminates and when it doesn't. Cool. Examples. 
So here is how such a um, program looks in data logo. It's impossible to read, but uh, it actually becomes very clear when you instantiate it to concrete semi-rings or concrete partially uh, ordered pre semi -rings. And here are two instanti the instantiations. Uh, we can instantiate it over, uh, over standard sets. And then this computes a set of uh, nodes X reachable from A, exactly what we had before. Uh, or we can instantiate it over the tropical semi-ring where the operators become uh, min and plus. And then we compute uh, the um, single source shortest path from A because we are seeing that the, the, the distance from A to a node X, the distance from A to a node X is zero if X is A, uh, or it is the smallest uh, possible values of the distances from A to G plus uh, the length of the edge from G to X. How does a naive uh, algorithm work, work here? I'm going to show you a simple example just to convince you that it's, it's, it's the right three sequence. So uh, we would start with the um, grounding of this relation R to B infinity, which is the smallest element in the, in the tropical semi-ring. And then we repeatedly apply this rule and we grow and grow and grow. This tropical semi-ring growing is, is it's bizarre because we grow from infinity towards zero until we reach a fixed point. Okay. Um, and notice that this is um, actually uh, it's um, kind of it's related to the weighted um, uh, adjacency matrix that Nicole showed us um, uh, showed us yesterday. Yeah, that is exactly it, it, it's the same computation. I want to show you one cool example, and this kind kind of illustrates the power and limitations of uh, extending data log to to um, pre semi rings, uh, namely the bill of material example, uh, which looked like this: the the total cost. And now here I, I called it Q. The total cost of a part X is uh, its own cost plus the sum of all the um, of all the total cost of all the subparts. So here I wrote this a little bit differently, and I will um, explain in a second why I didn't multiply them anymore. Okay. So um, this program, of course, will work fine if your subpart hierarchy is a tree. Even if it is a DAG, you might question what it computes if it's a DAG. I don't worry about what it computes. I, I worry about termination. Uh, the question is what happens if your, your subpart is uh, the cyclic graph? It probably it's not happening in real applications, but I'm interested in the termination. What happens to this program if the subpart has a cycle like it has right here? So now it depends in which semi-ring I interpret this program. Uh, I can interpret this over the semi ring of natural numbers. This is naturally ordered. So we start from zero and we repeatedly uh, apply the immediate consequence operator and the, the, ground, the, the values of these grounded atoms. They grow and grow and grow. And obviously, on the cycle, they will diverge. They will grow forever. So this, on this semi ring, the, the program diverges. But there is a second interpretation. Remember the lifted reals? This is where they become very useful. So uh, with the lifted reals, we start by initializing all the values to bottom. And then we repeatedly apply, apply the immediate consequence operator and we grow. Growing means that we can only grow from bottom to a value. Uh, and now we terminate. Uh, yeah, so this is the beauty of the, of the lifted reals. This is why people use this in the, the notational semantics of programming languages. Uh, when we, um, it has a well-defined semantics even where if there are cycles in the, the, ground, ground, in the gr grounded graph. <clears throat> so you don't have examples, but the, the weights could be negative there in the matrix, right? Good point. These weights can be negative. I think here I wanted to see negative weights. Not sure. Yeah, you want it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, here is a, a key observation. So I, I know I'm running uh, out of time, uh, but I want to um, insist on that observation. Yes. Uh, why, why didn't we have the number one in Q one and then C? Did I miss a number one? Uh, 
So the, the issue is that as long as this value is bottom, uh, you don't get anything because the cost plus bottom is is bottom. Okay. And this is a little the little annoying part. I can't multiply here. If I multiply, then even zero times bottom is still bottom, and then I can't make progress. So I need to separate this. Um, I, I, I need to have a little bit of um, logic here to control which um, uh, to control how to ground that program. Okay, I don't want to talk more about this. I want to show you something really, really important, and then we, maybe it's time to take a break. Notice that the nodes uh, on a uh, on the cycle, their values can never escape bottom. Okay, and this generalizes uh, the nodes on a, on a cycle can never escape the core semi ring. So that means that as we investigate termination. Of the, uh, of the program, uh, it suffices to focus on a naturally ordered semi-rings. So order is again restored in the universe. We don't need to worry about anything other than a naturally ordered semi -ring. Okay, good. So uh, let me skip these simple properties. Um, let me skip what we learned because I know everybody wants to take a break. But now it's quiz time. I'm going to leave this on, on, on uh, during the break. Uh, to, for you to, to ponder, what do these programs compute? Here at the top, uh, we have a very simple graph. It's a chain. Uh, every edge has a weight one. Uh, this program here computes coming of transitive closure, but what is the value from zero to n? What is the numerical value? And similarly for the second and for the third. Good. So thank you, folks. Um, let's resume after the break. Thank <laughs> you. 